me in the back? Yeah. Oh, wow, there we go. I can hear my voice now. Uh, I know I'm up here, and how often do you get to take selfies with almost 200 people staring back at you? So if you'll indulge me for a moment, uh, let's all have a DevOps Days uh, selfie real quick. If I can figure out how to operate my camera. All right, what's up, everyone? If you want, scoot in on the sides. Yeah, because I see a lot of gap right here. Uh, you can get close to each other. It's cool. There's a code of conduct, remember? All right, there we go. Thanks. Cool. I'm going to post that. I'm going to live tweet that right now from my own talk. There we go. All right, so yeah, so this is the evol evolution of Farm to Table and Code to Customer. Um, the reason for the title, as you'll find out, is I've got a background in the restaurant uh, industry, and also, as, as uh, you mentioned, uh, sometimes I work in a kitchen uh, that's uh, just north of here, so if you are still in the Chicagoland area, uh, let's see, next month I'll be in there, I usually work on Saturdays over there, because they only keep the kitchen open on weekends. Um, and then also, you might get a bonus that will feature today. Um, I clocked this at uh, under 30 minutes, um, but that's me going through it really fast, because in general I get nervous when I talk up here. Um, but uh, if, if you've never spoken before, uh, raise your hand, you don't have to be too nervous about this, but if you've never spoken before and you would like the opportunity, you will have one at the end of this talk. I actually have a separate talk that helps introduce new speakers to the stage. Uh, so don't worry, we can both be terrified up here together. It's a pre-built slide deck. It's programmer humor, so if you're not a programmer, um, you'll get the jokes later if you go read about programmer humor stuff. Um, but, and it's only about a minute and a half. It's super quick. I pre-built everything. You and I will just be up here just going back and forth. Just planning that seat now before I get started, okay? Um, but I do want to thank the DevOps Days organizers um, for inviting me up here finally. Uh, it's not from lack of trying. I think I've submitted every single year and got to the point where I was like, I'm just going to pull rank and you're going to be here. That's it. You're speaking. You haven't got the email yet, but you're speaking. I'm like, all right, fine. I can do that. Um, so thank you again for inviting me here. Um, let's get started. Uh, so for those who don't know me, and I was just introduced, uh, my name is Aaron Kalin. Um, my pronouns are he and him, if you're going to address me. Um, but as I was alluding to before, I'm actually a third generation uh, bar slash restaurateur. Uh, my family has had about eight uh, different bars and restaurants in the city and around the country. Um, they, a lot of them have more or less cashed out at this point. Uh, there's one that's still standing, but it's run by a part of the family that, you know, divorces have moved families off to the sides. Like, a couple of divorces have destroyed a lot of the, the family sort of empire in the restaurant and bar industry, but um, I, I've grown up in and around that. I know a lot about just restaurants in general, so I'm going to take you through a restaurant in this talk. Um, so I also, you know, have that right here because, like, yeah, I got this badass thing going on. This is when I did like multiple colors and it was beautiful. Uh, so I just cherish this photo because I don't think I'll ever be able to recreate it. Um, I love to call myself the redheaded rudiest because <laughs> I, I very much point out with the, the red hair, and everyone's like, yeah, there's Aaron. You can easily find me, and it's also fun to see like all the colored hair folks in the uh, at different conferences. Sometimes I'm the one and only one, but it's cool. Um, you might also see me as a stormtrooper. Um, I do this for charity. I'm part of the Fire and First Legion. That is my TK ID. So if you want to go look at the, uh, the public database, I think I'll be doing that on Saturday um, for one of the local sports teams. Actually, that it's a brand new one that's coming up, so they wanted to have like a whole Star Wars night. So I'm like, all right, I'll go do that. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm at MartiniSoft. Um, you'll also see me as a sluffy fox because you might have noticed me in the halls or up here. Um, you're not hallucinating unless you've had a lot of coffee. They do provide all of it every day, all day. Um, so if you've had too much of it, you might be hallucinating, but I am wearing a tail. Um, so yes, there is a full suit with it, and that is my husband next to me. We're both foxes. Um, I've also started moving some of my stuff to Mastodon as well. So if you're on there, I'm at, 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 at mastodon.social, but I'm at MartiniSoft on there. Uh, so if you want to address me, or if you want to learn more about the Fox stuff, we can talk about that over cocktails later. Um, I was brought to you here by DN Simple. Uh, actually matching my slides is really cool. <laughs> it's nice to have all that color coordination going. Uh, but we're a domain management automation company, so if you want to buy a domain connected via, uh, to your services via DNS and secure it with SSL service, because we do full Let's Encrypt automation. So if you let us be your authoritatives, we'll do the DNS challenge for you and deliver a certificate to you in a matter of minutes or less. Um, so if you really want to uh, you know, learn how that all works, we're actually built into tools that you use too. So if you're a, a chef or um, Terraform user, we're already there. So chef, we have a cookbook. Terraform, we've been baked in since day one because we have an open API. Um, and we support a lot of different clients, including the Go one. That's, that's why they added it in. But I'm sure all of you love manually assembling SSL certs, right? You remember the, you remember the combination for like Nginx or HA proxy? Um, but you also like working you know, on your buying service via buy, right? If you don't like that and you want to automate it, come talk to us, okay? So, in keeping with the theme, today's menu, right? 
Today's menu will feature uh, some dev accessory, um, though Andrew Schaefer kind of like, not exactly stole my thunder, I mean, he's the one who created it, so what can I, I can't knock him for that. Um, so I did edit some of my slides last minute to, to abbreviate it more, because if you were here earlier, you've already heard some of this. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, one of the best restaurants in the world, um, which is actually in Chicago. <laughs> Um, so you're going to learn how restaurants work from the inside out. Now, I will give this with a caveat. Once you know this information, uh, try not to weaponize it against the restaurants that you go to, but also this might ruin your restaurant experience because you now know, way, you kind of know how the sausage is made, so to speak. Um, so it could be really fun if you've always wanted to know how restaurants sort of work in a structure, you'll learn a lot today. Um, and then I'll use that information to see how we can drive the future of DevOps, all right? So I'm going to try to get a little bit predictive here and also say, like, here, this is what the restaurant industry can teach DevOps um, about how to work better and be more effective, okay? So let's go back in history. Let's go back to the 90s. Anyone remember that? <laughs> yeah? No? I'm going to call it the industrial age of technology. Because back in the 90s, like, companies were, like, the personal computer was starting to become more affordable. Larger mainframe systems were becoming more affordable to bigger companies. So a lot of companies started... Think, thinking like, okay, we can we can maybe maximize profit if we can cut down on some of this paper, go more digital. So let's just throw money at that problem. And companies like CDW are all too happy to be like, oh yes, you got a budget, please come here, we will help you spend it. Uh, so then they were just throwing tons of money at it, but it was really, really uh, lackluster. It wasn't great. Like they weren't very organized about it. Okay, you tried to, and even back then you had a literal pager, you had a physical pager. Someone would page you. And if you were, if you had a big friend at work about it, you also had like special codes that your pager would have. So you knew if you needed to go to a payphone right away, or if you were lucky, you had a massive bag phone or a giant thing on the side of your head uh, that you would have to use to call up your friends if you got paid. Uh, just to get an idea, of, like point in time in history, CF Engine first appeared in '93. So if you think about CM tools and all that stuff too, it was very much you know archaic like this is the industrial age like we're just starting to learn how all this technology stuff works even at scale um, and if you want to as uh, Andrew was talking about before talking about scrum and, and agile and things like that the early days of scrum and extreme programming right sounds crazy but it actually was and those those were actually the early days of that those systems agile was starting to become a thing a little bit um, but in the 2000s once we start going up I'd say we've started growing up I think it's the start of the information age in technology because CM tools were happening, Scrum and Agile and all that started happening in companies. Companies were figuring out like, oh wow, we blew a ton of money on a lot of hardware, but we have no idea how to use it. And we have no idea how to make it more efficient. We can't figure out how this works. The Agile Manifesto actually happened in 2001, if you remember that. It's been a long time since that first got penned. Um, and then the emergence of bigger uh, config management tools like Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible will come way later. Stuff like that. And so, and, and all these things started to, a lot, these newer tools allowed us to start getting faster and more efficient and better at these things. Uh, and even to give you another point of reference, too, Git was released in 2005. Anyone still using CDS? If you are, you should be talking to people how to convert to Git or something else. Because uh, I use CDS and I still have bad memories that I talked to a therapist about over that tool alone. <laughs> and then, of course, it, you know, it's got one half of the two that first coined this back in 2008. DevOps was first coined back then. And then, then you had the first DevOps days a year later. All right, but Andrew Schaefer and Patrick Dubois both coined that back then. There was the, the tweet that he showed earlier. And this diagram is shown along with it, right? Because you know, he's showing walls. I think they're more like concentric circles, but think of those circles sort of as walls. But you have you know, development team, you have quality assurance, you have operations, and generally they'd be warring factions. And even a lot of companies today, they are still warring factions. But the idea of DevOps is to, in the center, create a little party with everyone there. I say the development team can talk to QA and be like, here, how can we test the software better so that way you know, customers don't hit issues or bugs? And then how can operations better deliver that software so that way developers can get software out to the customer quicker, right? So I'm going to return back to this slide, but I just wanted to provide some context here in case you're new to the DevOps thing, never heard about it before. Um, but I'm also going to get a little bit trolly here because why not? I'm up here. I've heard DevOps also a job title. <laughs> so there are some people, who, who's hiring a DevOps engineer right now? It's cool, you can raise your hand. Some of them is like, yeah, I need to hire people. And, and, and I'm not going to even go nuts with this too. Like, I'll leave all the trolling up to Andrew if he wants to. Um, the, new, the new thing, uh, which will fix my broken organization, right? DevOps is that solve that if I rub it on my organization hard enough, everything will be magic, <laughs> right? And it's free, right? It's supposed to be free. 
Um, or maybe a DevOps is a magical unicorn person that writes my website, tests it, deploys it, keeps it secure, and then also updates stats on my users so I know how much I'm selling. That, uh, that is not, not joking. I've seen some job titles that are almost that. So let's not, let's not, let's stop. Let's think about that for a minute. It's not even, I'm not even go into just arguing about DevOps, okay? So I'll take a deep breath. So let's just keep up. There we go. Let's go back to the menu, because we're done with the DevOps history. I'm just going to go out of the way here. Let's go back over to my favorite subject here, restaurants. So I'm going to take you through one of the best, uh, it was regarded to as one of the best in the world. It's actually one of the top 10. Um, it's here in Chicago called Alinea. Um, and they've, if you know about the Michelin rating system and all that stuff, it's really weird that the entire company is, is one of the bigger authoritatives. Like Zagat used to be one of the really big ones. Um, but Michelin is, is another Michelin guy is a big thing, and you get a number of stars. There's getting one star is a really big achievement in the restaurant industry. If you can get one star, that means you're really, really good at what you do. If you get two stars, it means you are pretty damn good at what you do. And if you get three stars, you're regarded as one of the best in the world. Um, it's a very, very coveted thing to hit that three stars. This restaurant has hit that three stars for several years in a row. Um, so, as, according to the Michelin Guide, this is supposed to be the pinnacle of a food and dining experience. Because it's more than just sitting down and getting a plate of food and enjoying yourself. Uh, places like Alinea want you to experience food in an entirely different way. Because I'm here at, you know, with this picture here, it's actually kind of hard to find more current pictures of Alinea. In fact, the opening slide was their old prep kitchen. Um, but this one here is actually from one of their concepts that they did while they were redoing their restaurant. Because they actually decided to, even though they were fully successful with the concept they had, they tore it down and started up again. They did three separate concepts in the same building. Um, and so one of the parts of the, uh, the experience they had is you actually go through this door. And it's very similar to when you know, they change the menu, it's seasonal. So what will happen before you can get to the restaurant, someone will call you and ask if you've got any allergies they need to know about, et cetera, if there's any particular special occasion you're there for, if it's an anniversary, stuff like that. And that's so they know before you even get in the door, you know, what you're there for and what you are capable of experiencing. So say if you have a shellfish allergy, they'll make sure either to substitute parts of the menu or maybe leave them out if they can or give you a slightly different experience overall. And when you walk in through that front door, you're greeted by a whole set of front of house staff. Okay, and I'm not going to draw these directly to your job yet. That will happen in the next set of slides. Um, you'll be greeted by the host, um, who will take you to your table. And at the table, your server will take your order, right? And if it's a fancy restaurant, they might have a wine expert come by. They're called sommelier, but they're basically people who are really, really good at wine, and they know how to pair different wines with different courses. Like, if you go into the super fancy restaurants, you will see this. Um, and eventually, you'll finish what is on your plate, or you'll need to, you know, that order will get created in the kitchen, and then someone has to bring that food out to you. So they have what they call expediters or food runners, and their job is to bring the food to you. Um, or they might take your plate away uh, via the bussers or something like that, because those folks will have, like, usually bus tubs, or they'll just take your plate away very nicely. They'll, they'll politely excuse themselves when they do so. Um, and then at that point, it just all goes through. And then it ends up, you know, somewhere in this story, you've got the back of house. So this is that same prep kitchen uh, photo here. This is the Linnea's old prep kitchen. Um, you see what well, looks kind of like organized chaos here at this point. There's one, one person clearly just standing there just waiting. He's likely waiting for the, the plate in the dish or he's waiting for something else to come in. And this guy's staring at the camera wondering why there's someone taking his photo, of course. But um, in there, there's, there's a whole set of uh, an army of people that handle dealing with your food order, and then especially with the larger restaurants like Alinea, everything is timed. Every sequence is very carefully executed. So in the back, you'll have the executive chef or the, the, the head chef, the person who's basically running the show. They're the ones calling the shots. They're kind of like the manager in the kitchen. They'll also generally do the cooking, too, with the staff. If they need to gap fill in anywhere, they will be there. If they need to help run a station, if someone needs to take a break, they will do it. Um, those executive chefs will be usually assisted by what they call sous chefs, so the, the, basically the assistant chef that are beneath them. Um, they'll also have people to prepare all those ingredients, the prep and line cooks. And then eventually, all those dishes have to go somewhere and get reset to the next thing, so you have a dishwasher. Believe it or not, that's a super important uh, job in, in the back house, because if you can't wash and clean and sanitize those dishes, you can't bring them out to the next set of customers. Because the only way you make money in a restaurant is if you're turning those tables over over and over again. The more you rinse and repeat that, the more profit you can make. 
because otherwise you have to charge an exorbitant amount per dish, and no one's really going to go do that. Like, would you pay $500 a dish just to have a restaurant that's only open for one set of courses? I don't think anyone would. So the way you make money is by getting those people to go to an restaurant. Um, and if you're super fancy, you'll actually have a pastry chef or someone who's in charge of sauces, what we call the saucier. Uh, the patissier is another one that's a very French. This all, all the, a lot of this stuff comes from uh, an old French style of restaurant building. This was invented back in the early turn of the century, um, and even like the late 1800s or so, it's called the brigade system. Um, but a lot of uh, larger, bigger restaurants use this type of system. Um, and they have these different roles. Some of these roles are played by more than one person. Like if you're gonna go to a greasy spoon, all of these job titles might belong to one person. Just to give you an idea. Uh, the same goes for the front of house part. Your server might be your host, the person who sits you down. They might also bust the table as well. Like the, your one server might be doing several jobs at once. Uh, but at the, the much fancier restaurants, these are generally separate roles, but they all work together in order to create an experience. And in the restaurant industry, becoming a manager usually means you have to work every single position. Um, it, like the, the best path to take in a restaurant uh, in the restaurant world is to start as a dishwasher or a busser or something like that and work your way up the system. Um, and you may not be the best cook and all that stuff, but even if you can be a good prep cook and assist the executive chef, you'll know way more if you, once you get up to the management side of things, if you have like a dishwasher that's having you know, a bad time, you can go in, you can sympathize with them because you know that either they're getting overloaded or you know what their job sort of feels like. You feel their pain because you've moved around the different positions and you, you have sort of an idea of what's going on. And even when you become a manager, it doesn't mean you're not working those positions ever. Because if you have someone call out then, and you only have limited staff because you can't, it's not like in tech where you can just be like, oh, well, so-and-so is not working today. Guess we won't really ship that code. It's not really gonna work when you, when you, so you have like reservations booked up and people are expecting for you to serve them food. You know, as a manager, you may have to step into that role and take it over in order to, to, to handle things. And going to culinary school does not instantly make you a master chef. Just like if I, did, if I went to school right now and did a, did a computer science degree, could I work in a DevOps team right now? Maybe. Yeah, no, I didn't hear any like, and I was like, yeah, cool, we can do that. We'll, we'll take someone directly out of computer science and they can, they can DevOps immediately, right? Um, the thing that a lot of uh, really good restaurants do is something they call family meals. So they'll actually sit down before service and they'll actually cook a meal together. It usually be stuff that's not even on menu. Sometimes it'll be out, uh, it will be a test thing like that they want to put on the menu and they want to get some feedback from their peers. Um, so a lot of them will sit down together and it also helps with bonding, like team cohesion and all that stuff because you know, the line cooks, the executive chef, the dishwasher, everyone gets fed so when you're in service you've got that energy level and all that stuff too. Plus you all are kind of sharing space together because hey, you're all about to be working together, working your asses up together while people come in and be like, hey, I want food, I need a good experience and all that stuff. Uh, and if you want to become a great chef though, right? So maybe you did your computer science degree or maybe you went to you know, culinary school and all that stuff. If you want to become a great chef, you generally have to work under a, great, a, a really good chef itself. Like if you want to become a great chef, go work under, and I hear a lot of people in the tech industry say like, oh, because I go work with so-and-so, I am a better person in my career for it. And it's very true in the, in the chef and cook community. Like really, really good chefs, especially like the one who now runs Alinea, one of the best in the world, he worked under some of the best chefs. He worked under French Laundry, he was here uh, in, under Charlie Trotter, if anyone remembers uh, the, the Charlie Trotter restaurants and stuff like that. He actually worked under him. Not the nicest person in the world, but also was very hard on his employees to make sure that they would be the best that they could be. And now, without effective communication in restaurants too, you probably experienced any of these problems indirectly. So if any of these teams, any of those job roles that you saw, if any of them don't communicate one way or another, problems will happen. Like the worst one at the bottom there, cross-contamination, if you have an allergy, that is a huge thing for you, right? Because if you, if you tell them ahead of time and they forget or, they, or the server gets up to one of the cooks there and that cook does not prepare your food, someone else does, and they put something you were allergic to, that can be a free hospital trip for you. You don't want that, right? Because, because with, with bad communication, stuff like that happens, or have you ever gotten you know, a plate of food and it's cold, or it's not cooked right, or something's off in the seasoning, something like that, or worse, you know, what most people generally experience is slow service, right? Your server might be overloaded because they're handling six or seven tables at a time. They might be working four different job positions at the same time. 
So without that communication, if that, if that person isn't talking to the manager and the manager isn't doing something about it, the manager isn't stepping in, then you're just going to have a bad time in general. You usually see this stuff when, when those communication lines break down. So let's talk about how these lessons from the restaurant community, like how the restaurant community works and how this can be applied to the future of DevOps. And as I just said, more effective communication. And not just talking, too. Also writing and even being amongst your own peers and being able to communicate ideas more effectively. This is something I still work on at my work because I'm a full remote employee. Um, so conveying ideas effectively is a huge, huge thing you have. It's, a, it's that hurdle that you, at least for me, has never felt like I've been able to fully master it. I do get it wrong, and the best part is, is to figure out when you get it wrong and reacting to correct yourself and get to the, the next best thing. So especially since uh, my company, we have uh, people from several nationalities, and English isn't their first language. So I try not to use the really crazy, complicated words, because they'll be like, what? Hang on, I need to use a dictionary and then I need to translate it from Spanish to English. Or maybe Italian to English or something, or English to Italian, so they can better understand what I'm talking about. So with that more effective communication, you as, as a team in general will immediately benefit from something like that. Um, something I also try to personally strive for too, we do this in my company, um, but mentorship and apprenticeships. Anyone doing an apprenticeship program at their company? No? One? Two? I want to see more hands next time I'm, I'm up here, if I am up here another time. Because I think this is a really, really effective way to expand your horizons and also reaches out. And, and it's not so much, too, that, that by doing the mentorship and apprenticeship thing, like by opening the doors to it, that it's just instantly going to solve your problems. You will have to actively reach out to minorities and communities that are underrepresented. Here in Chicago, we have zero excuse. We have so many great organizations here that you just need to go talk to. And they will talk your ear off about how many people they have to fit your opportunities. And you'd be surprised like, by just reaching out to those things, how fast you can get information, and also just learn how you can expand your organization's horizons by doing that. Um, and as I was saying before, if you want to be a manager, you should try different roles. Why don't you do that as yourself? Like, if you're a developer, have you done any operations work before? Have you, have you gone through and built any like, QA testing suites for your things? I mean, I'm sure as a developer, you all test, right? Yes? Nervous laughter and some acknowledgement and all of those like no. Right? Maybe maybe go be a QA person for a week, test your software, try breaking it. See if you can create a new bug report that you're gonna groan at, but then hopefully you go and fix it because you just created the problem, so hopefully you're the best person to resolve it. Uh, something my, my boss likes to do is what he calls pain-driven development. Um, everyone in, in D and Simple actually manages the support queue. Um, so we do it even on the weekends, we, we spend about an hour or so. Um, to go to the support queue and actually feel our customers' pain. If they're having a problem, they can't issue a certificate, they can't buy a domain or something like that, we need to know that stuff immediately. And the way you can find that is when someone is honestly angry, being angry with you on Twitter, because <laughs> we get our Twitter feed through our, our support inbox, but also they might be sending you, you know, not so happy email, but that's your opportunity to learn how to communicate to your customers. Even if you're a developer and you don't like interacting with people, you really need to, to figure out how you can bridge that gap. Because when you are there and you feel their pain, you see what's going on, then you can be there. That's, just, that's why I think like really good chefs will come out from the kitchen once in a while and go meet the customers and ask them how the food and meal looks. Like if they do, that's a sign of a great chef because they want to know. Because honestly, they're going to be their own most critics. They say like, "All my food sucks," uh, but meanwhile, they're you know the place has got a line out the door and people love their food. But you won't know until you see. Or if you have, have, you, have you any of you gone to go meet your customers too? Have you gone to like on site with a customer before? Even as a developer, have you gone to just see them using your software or whatever product you build? Like you should go do that. See what. See how it's all you know being used out in the wild. And don't forget to celebrate each other. Um, we're really quick to jump to Twitter when Netflix is down, right? And be like, oh, I can't get my Netflix. Sucks. And, and the, like, the, the, some of the better ones of us would be like, Hug Ops, the Netflix, I'm really sorry, S3 team, it looks like you guys are having a bad day. Um, but even internally, too, if someone screws up and all that, it, and again, that's why we try to do the blameless post mortem. So we want to know what problem happened and how we can correct it. Um, but at the same time, too, like, get together with your team. I'm remote, so every quarter, you know, we try to get together someplace in the world and be together because you don't know someone being snarky on Slack is being genuinely snarky, or if that's just how their humor is. When you see them in person and you interact with them, you'd be like, oh, okay, that's just how so-and-so carries themselves. I don't want to go reach through the computer and punch them. 
right? Uh, do internal demo days. Show off some really cool ideas internally that may create new things. Like Gmail is famously an internal like demo project at Google when it became a thing. Now you, most of you have Gmail addresses, right? Uh, do internal bug bounties. You know, some companies will do a thing where they have a board where a customer support person comes across a, a problem, it's a bug, and they feel it's really important that, that it get fixed. So the company gives them a stipend to like buy the Amazon gift cards or I'll take you to lunch. And they'll just put it up on a board, and if that developer goes and fixes the problem, then they go get to have free lunch on the company. Um, only because one of the persons like, hey, I felt this customer's pain, they, they can benefit from this if you go fix this problem. So let's go back to that, that concentric circles. And you get to see my awesome Photoshop work in a minute. Um, <laughs> but I, I think some stuff is missing here. So for me, it's the future of DevOps. You're, is anyone tell me what's missing here? There's a couple things that are missing. This was mentioned earlier today, actually. A few things here. Bingo. Someone, heard, someone might be seeing my slides here. Yeah, so you probably have heard of some breaches going on. You know, there's a few companies that have had some famous uh, security breaches. Anyone dealing with GDPR right now? Yeah, we, we have been because it's, it's been the fun thing in the, in the world when you have to protect who is data, but you also need that to transfer information. It's, it's a big mess in the, uh, the DNS and the domain world. But you probably have a security team to tell you about, hey, the code you're shipping really quickly, why are you base 64 encoding the secrets? And like, you know, this is, but and at the same time, too, like maybe the QA person uncovers some, some bug where they can click a button and they're logged into the system. So maybe the security team needs to work with maybe operations or development to make sure that that stuff works. I think they really should be part of the, the party here. And now there's some folks out there that are saying like, hmm, well, if we add security, we need to rename it. It needs to be DevSecOps. So I'd like, to, I'd like to be the first to introduce you all to, hi, welcome to DevSecOps Days, <laughs> Chicago edition, right? Um, but I, and I personally don't agree with this because, I mean, yeah, it does include security in there, but I think you should still bring them into the party because they, they can provide benefits to all three of those, those things there. But there's still one more section missing. And this was actually talked about yesterday. There's a really awesome talk about big data. Right? I call it big data because that's the big fun buzzword, and I kind of play buzzword bingo and one of the squares. Um, but big data would be your folks who do your artificial intelligence. How many, how many folks here have that as a product feature that you have some special artificial intelligence that will find all of your problems for you, or at least suggest better solutions to those problems? Right? There's some data scientists maybe that are working at your company, and they're looking at you know, consumer data and all that stuff. Maybe they'll uncover a security bug they have to talk to security folks about. It. Or they can inform operations how fast things are shipping or how well that Nginx server is working. Do, do those are the tuning you know, buttons and knobs and dials you're messing with working for you? I don't know. But without them being part of the party, how are you going to properly do an effective DevOps culture at your company? So I'm basically at the end right here, so I'm going to give you some reminders. So remember, DevOps really just means you should be communicating. Like, if I was going to boil down the idea of DevOps into one thing, talk to each other. Start with that. Really. Like just, you need to actually have some level of action and interact with each other. Um, try different roles in your, in your organization. Like, be a developer for a day, or sit alongside a developer, do some pair programming maybe. Even if you don't have any idea what you're doing, being a second set of eyes is actually super helpful, and it would be educational for both of you. Because if you'll be so new to it, you'll question everything, and it's really fun to see developers panic when you ask about the most basic stuff and they don't have an immediate answer for you. Been there, done that, it's really fun. Um, foster mentorship or apprenticeship. Yeah, I only saw a couple of hands go up. I want to see more, and I don't. Every, like, I've harped on this for many, many years, and I still don't see this happening. Let's come in an actual thing about this, because we're here doing you know, the DevOps days thing. Let's, let's make an uh, open space about it. Um, don't forget your security and big data folks. If you forget about them, then you may have a security issue. You'll get blindsided, and then before you know it, you're hiring expensive security consultants that told you you're doing it wrong the whole time because your developers are playing fast and loose with your, uh, your credentials. And then, again, the, the really, really big point here, because I love other people, and I at least try to get to know them better, celebrate others uh, more often than you do now. Talk with your boss, your, your upper, upper management, and see, like, hey, how can we do some awesome things together. Can I take them all bowling? Or can I, you know, can we go out on like a sailing trip or something? I don't know, something fun you can do and figure out the budget at the end. Like, I'm sure at the, at the end you can figure out some way to get intrinsic benefit out of it and everyone can work with it. So thank you again for your time.
There it is. Yeah, thank you again for your time. That is all of my handles and stuff and everything there. Um, it's a beautiful background shot of Chicago. Um, but thank you again for your time and for listening to me. Um, and if we have a little bit of time, we can do one more, one more thing. You want to? Okay, yeah. It's only about a minute and a half. So uh, thank you again. You can applaud now for now. <laughs> So, does anyone want to come up here and deliver a talk with me? Okay, you got me one, one volunteer. I want to see more. It's, it's cool. The, talk, the slides are already built. And we'll both be up here and be silly. You sure? Also, I love that backup. There we go. All right, cool. Come on. What's your name? Jody. Jody. Everyone, Jody. What's your favorite color? Red. Uh, okay, cool. Um, choose between green and blue. 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 Okay, so whenever you see the blue slides come up here, read down here. Okay, so the next one coming up is that, so you'll be the first one. So, this is overheard between programmers. So the programmers in the audience, you might giggle and laugh, totally cool. The ones that are not programmers, talk to them because you need to know why they're laughing. All right? This is a way to meet programmers in the audience. Maybe you want to hire them someday. You ready? So I read the blue slide. Down. What's that query? Not sure. A bug for your thoughts. I think the code in the skits. Maybe give it a carry? You're not too sharp, are you? Why don't you put a hat on it? Wait, 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 what's your angle here? Look, I just want to mod this code to work. <laughs> Me too. I'm amped to deliver this code. Are you suggesting we bang out this code? <laughs> yeah, just grab a bunch of keys. I'm not not suggesting it. <laughs> if you do that, I'm going to shriek. Okay, just brace for the awesome. What hash are you smoking? <laughs> it's a dick in Python? Well, I had a pretzel this morning. <laughs> well, I had a grape strudel my parents made. Had a little squiggle of frosting. Doesn't taste like Octothorpe. What? <laughs> so you want to ship some code? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.